Welcome, everybody, back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY in Manhattan, in New York City at the City University. And it is uh, week 12 of um, our uh, daily talks during the week with theater artists from around the world, but of course also from uh, New York and uh, from the Americas. And, um, and it is uh, slowly getting into summer and uh, we are uh, in a way hopeful, it looks like that bars and restaurants and shops might open, will open next week. There are some troubling signs. Uh, uh, New Yorkers, as we all are, we don't seem to fully respect uh, the rules of distancing and wearing masks. Everybody is so is happy to be out. And uh, there are cases around the world um, of new outbreaks, uh, complexes in Germany, in Berlin, uh, where 300 people in uh, one big building have been infected. So there are pockets of new infections. And we don't know, numbers also seem to be going up in Texas and others, even so our government says, no, it's just because people are tested, but we'll have to see what uh, what will come and what not. There are slightly disturbing news. Uh, there are some studies suggest that even immunity after you had COVID, after three or four months might not protect you. So um, it is uh, still a devastating uh, situation. I think one more million, one million more people filed for unemployment in America last week. Uh, it's a devastating yeah. situation. So many people who are infected, over a million, and uh, so many died. And uh, we have to see where it leaves the theater community that has been hit so hard as um, all artists. Um, Black Lives Matters, of course, the civil unrest on the streets for very good reason, changed everything. We started talking about Corona, but this now also has, of course, been on our mind and we dedicated the entire last week um, to the subject. And today is, and we have to acknowledge it, uh, Juneteenth, the, um, the, the news of uh, slavery, the end of slavery when it finally uh, 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 was uh, delivered to in Galveston, Texas, uh, to, to, to slaves what Lincoln had signed into law. Um, was now, and I think it's a significant day, also City University decided this week to uh, have a day of uh, non-working. Many companies uh, ended all meetings uh, to honor uh, this. And I would like to uh, take the moment to remember one of the great abolitionists, um, David Walker, and what he wrote in 1828. Uh, the great philosopher, black philosopher, Tommy Shelby, wrote about in the new uh, history of literature for America where I said David Walker proclaimed that the children of Africa will have to stay, take their stand among the nations of the earth. And it was about white supremacy and black solidarity. David Walker, black American was born free in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1796. And as a young man, he traveled extensively around the South serving uh, observing the injustices of the slave system um, after um, black churches where he belonged to um, were uh, suppressed. Uh, he moved to Boston where he worked in a closing store, helped uh, freeze, run away, sl helped slaves, run away slaves. And he uh, organized a black uh, community and he delivered um, uh, um, an oration and soon enough afterwards uh, a pamphlet with uh, Tommy Shelby said, um, it was the indecentary, in, in, in incendiary and soon enough notorious appeal in four articles towards the preamble to the colored citizens of the world, but in particular and very expressively to those of the United States in America, uh, the most militant anti-slavery document that ever been published. And he describes the feature of oppression under slavery and argues that blacks have a duty to resist their oppressors, even using violence uh, if uh, they have to. And uh, he exposes the way into white Christian ministry uphold the slave uh, system Preachers uh, reinforced that the institution of slavery, the white churches uh, teaching, you know, that it was their duty to obey their masters and evoking uh, the curse of descendants uh, of harm. And um, even when blacks became Christian, as Walker noticed, uh, they were still not granted the same rights as white. Nevertheless, he remained uh, a devout Christian. He upheld that it was an absolute duty to fight against injustice and that oppression was no excuse uh, for, for not uh, engaging. And he said, men will have to fight uh, a glorious fight and a heavenly fight of freedom. And um, it was unjust as his uh, pamphlet he, uh, was of course forbidden. A, a bounty was placed on its head. Blacks were uh, no longer allowed to read that, uh, to gather. And uh, it really caused, it was directed towards the black community only. And uh, he said, it's their right and their duty to throw off a government because 
it has the same right as Jefferson said in his Declaration of Independence, it would also apply to African Americans. And Jefferson's idea that um, it was um, um, uh, actually not uh, of value because the black race was not, couldn't be compared to, to the white one is completely wrong. He saw that early, he took action, he wrote, he fought, and he's a great, great American. And, um, and he ended his uh, uh, pamphlet and he said, he believed racial reconciliation, reconciliation in America was possible and desirable. He said, treat us like men and we will be your friends. And there's no doubt in my mind but that the whole of the past will be sunk into oblivion and under God, we will become united and happy people. So he, uh, I think had a great message already then. And uh, it's a, important to honor, to honor um, this day, which we have today. Um, slavery of course has been uh, 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 present around the world for centuries. And um, as we talk to artists from all around the world, we today, have with us Saman Amini, who comes uh, from uh, Iran, from Persia. By the way, who also had North American slaves. Uh, there are studies now being done that they had North African slaves, I mean, and uh, the history is being unfolded. And uh, 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 Saman is uh, now living in the Netherlands, in, in Holland, and um, he came as a refugee to that country. And uh, we heard from him, from uh, our friend Alessandra Benedetti, who said, you know, this is an important artist and he has something to say. And so we're gonna to listen today to him and his experience uh, of uh, being a refugee coming to the Netherlands and uh, uh, getting into the world of theater, but also now um, experiencing the world of uh, Corona, of COVID, of confinement. And so uh, Saman, first of all, thank you for taking the time. I know you have no idea who we are, what HowlRound is, you haven't <laughs> listened to any of the talks. Um, but uh, thanks for taking the time to, to share with us um, um, and your experience. Where are you right now? Uh, in what city, uh, in the, I guess, in the Netherlands? And what time is it? Uh, time is, is uh, 1807, uh, yeah. seven minutes. And I'm in Amsterdam, in the center, center of Amsterdam. I was very lucky to find this place, a small place. Uh, and uh, I've, I've, I live here for two years now. What's the, uh, what's the neighborhood called where you are in Amsterdam? It's called the Rozegracht, uh, and it, it's the Jordan, the neighborhood. The Jordan, no. the Jordan. Jordan, oh good. So Jordan, that, that, Jordan, yeah. That's, that's fantastic. It must be already a beautiful uh, summer with everything blooming. Um, how it is, is the very... Yeah? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, how is the situation uh, with COVID and uh, Corona and confinement and all of it. Tell us a little bit what's happening in the Netherlands. It's, it's, it was also very chaotic for us. I think that, I think like this for, for, for everyone, it's like a one-time thing that happens in your life. I hope so. And, and to me, like emotionally, personally, uh, of course you have the, what it did to the society, but when I'm talking about a, with, with, with a lot of friends of mine is, is on a way we were like uh, me, if I take myself, I was like, um, I had some demons like from the past that I had faced and I was, and I come to the, I came to the conclusion that I was running away for a very long time. And I was uh, using theater, my work uh, to, to, you know, to get by. And when the Corona virus came, it pulls that, tool my being like a little workaholic that I am it, it took that away from me and then I, and I, and then I had to face those thoughts those images those pictures you can call it monsters or something and that was very interesting to finding like uh, who you are and that's strange because I've I'm, I'm from Iran and I've always I, I was a laugh at that idea that the people going to travel to Australia to find themselves and um uh, uh, but now I understand that the meaning of that, like what's my narrative, who am I, where, where I'm coming from, and and that to me that was a very powerful thing that I I I, I get to find and I get get the, get the opportunity to look at during the corona, and that's for me personally emotionally, and so it, it it has been very good to me actually on a on a strange way, and uh, society wise. You know, of course, people lost their jobs and we, we lost our projects, but, and it's terrible to everyone. 
but because we have access to the internet right now and I've been following all over the world and I came to the conclusion that we as Dutch people living in the Netherlands, we are very lucky. We are very lucky to have such government and such mentality in the government that they took care of us, you know? I, I get, I lost all my, all my jobs and I still catch like thousand euros for three months from the government. And, and that sounds normal to us, but it's very impressive. And I'm, the reason I'm also doing this talk with you is I hope like the giving details that the American people or the people who are looking that they, 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 they could see and feel what their rights actually are, you know, where they are entitled to as human beings, especially in such a big, rich country of the United States. So, um, of course, we have our struggles, but, you know, as an artist, the work's never done. So uh, when I got back and uh, got back up and emotionally, I had my stuff, I had it all uh, on bomb place and I ordered it. I start to work, man. I'm, I'm, I'm writing and I'm not getting paid for it, but uh, um, I'm looking forward, you know, to just go out there and just work again. So when did it start? Was there a lockdown? Were you supposed to, in your apartment, could you go out? Do you have to print out forms? How we never had that. No, we never had that extreme lo uh, lockdown. Uh, they, they did advise us, you know, we, of course you couldn't go to theaters and crowd places. They stopped it. Like, I think like it was end of February, but I don't know the date. I think it was end of February, beginning, beginning of March. But it, it wasn't that extreme, like not, not being able to go to the city like some other countries. And, um, and, 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 and that's it. Of course, we, the theaters are closed and even my, my new, new play that I'm writing is gonna be, uh, gonna be in September. It's, and it's a big possibility that I'm gonna play this in front of only 100 audience in a big, uh, in, a, in, a, in a theater where, you know, you can have 500 people. So that's gonna be, that's gonna be a challenge, of course, but still, you know, so we're I'm, all be, I'm, I'm gonna be, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Were all, were all stores closed and restaurants in, uh, in the Netherlands in March? Was restaurants, not all stores. No, no. We also have, you know, the people who were stolen toilet papers and those stupid stuff. We also had it here. But the, the supermarkets were always open. There, of course, restaurants, the crowded places, they're all closed, but they are open from 1 uh, June. The restaurants are open. You can go uh, fix your nails, fix your hair, but the theaters are still closed. Uh, they, 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 uh, no, so they're open, but you you can only play for thirty men in June, and in July it's going to be I think more. They're going to. So it opened for resume. thirty people performances. Uh, have you seen one? No, no, I haven't. I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, the moments I'm working when I'm creating, I, I don't see anything. Like I'm just like really writing and being very selfish as an artist because because this is the. When you're writing and going to do a play, I'm writing the songs and the whole thing myself. It's like all the time I have is going to this play. So do you, um, did, did, you, what did, did you do anything during Corona time online or Zoom? Or did, do you follow Dutch artists who engaged uh, in forms of uh, uh, continuing their work? Or is it a time for everybody to say, we have to stop and think? Yeah, I saw a lot of like, People like try to do theater like online and with, but that's just, it doesn't work. That's the, that's the beauty of theater, you know, is that you're going to sit there and see it. Otherwise it's going to be film or, or live demonstration. So the things I saw, I wasn't really getting very enthusiastic about it because it didn't work for me. My attention fell away after five or 10 minutes and it's because it's like uh, watching through a, through a screen to theater. That's, that's just like, it's weird. That's weird. It didn't work. For me, it doesn't work. Hmm. So um, t t tell us a bit. You are, um, you, you came, um, I think, age of 10 or 12, you came to the Netherlands. Tell us a bit your story about uh, where you came from and how, how was your experience yeah. and how did you get into theater? Yeah, I was, um, I, I, I was born in Iran, Tehran. And... And my parents decided to flee to Iran when I was 11. And br they, they brought me uh, to the Netherlands against my will. Uh, what I year hated, was that? I hated the, I, uh, the, the 2000, September. 2000. It was, yeah. So it's funny. So every time when I get the introduction that I flee from Iran, it's always 
I was, it always do something to me because it wasn't really a choice for me as a child. Don't get me wrong. I'm thankful. You know, I yeah, yeah, yeah. But you liked it. Right now, but... liked it. Yeah. Why did yeah. they, why did and they leave? Why did your parents leave? It's, you know, it's a combination. I don't want to get to the details, but it's, it's, it's coming. If I would, Tell the tell it universally. It's that my my mom's. It's all about having like a getting to a place where you have the right to dream. You know, to dream and chase those dreams. Uh, that 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 would be that would do. It. And and it was all about the children. It was all about having a better life for me. I was talking to you. You know, I'm, I came to the Netherlands, and even in Iran, we, I lived in a pr pretty uh, rough neighborhood, poor, uh, poor neighborhood. And uh, if I wasn't here in the Netherlands, if I would end up in the United States or in Iran, I don't think I would be able to, uh, to be a uh, study theater and study acting like, that, like I did because probably was going to take care of my parents. Um, Traditionally, Iranians often would go to America, but that has changed. People, they, go to, they prefer Europe at the moment as a country to go to or as a place. Yeah, I think like that's, a very, that's very, that's like, Because there's a lot of similarities in the United States and Iran, especially when you're in LA. Like it's, it's crazy. Like there's, it's a lot of a lot in common between those cultures. And uh, but that's like 40 years ago. A lot of people went to uh, uh, went to the United States. I think still, but our plan was to get to Canada. Uh, but you know, because of circumstances, we end up to uh, getting in, in the Netherlands. Um, um, And yeah, I'm gonna get it back. So I was 11 when I came here. Uh, my father couldn't he couldn't make it, and he came five years later. So I, I was growing up this little angry boy. I was this angry boy who wasn't. I back then I knew I was angry, and I I felt like dehumanized by by also the situation that I was the refugee. Uh, I felt it when the, the way people would look at me, you know, when I was waiting for bus, and uh, and this this is all things I discovered when I got older, you know, uh, and um, so I, I become like feeling this frustrations and feeling this injustice that was done to me or to us as immigrants, and and I always had a big mouth and I was always the, the guy who they used to tell from, let, let him tell the story. So it was always in me, the, the telling story part. And then I, when I was 17, there was this organization um, who organized theater workshops for kids from the, ref, traumatized kids from the refugee camp. So, so they would like uh, find a way to express their feelings. And that's how I rolled into it, you know? I, 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 uh, so the Dutch Especially. government had a, had workshops. Uh, it was with the theater, and it was uh, in your school or on the street in the neighborhoods. It's not, Where not, was it's not it? quite like the government. Like you know, there's like this government budget, mm -hmm. uh, and a part of it is for culture. And then all organizations, if you like, you can start like a, a company and you can apply for it. And there was the company. Uh, that What company Solica. was it? It was. It's not a company. It's a stichting. I don't know. I said it in English, but it was. Uh, it was. Uh, Uh, foundation it said in english yes. mm -hmm. it's, so, it's, so it was a foundation and the whole thing was that they would like bring children refugee children from the refugee camp so get them at their environment and just um, just make sure they get to know art and for us it was theater so it would be like every friday we would go to another city and we would go uh, we, we, we would do theater you know and my the first motivation was is I was like, oh, so I get money to get away from the refugee camp on Friday and there have, they're going to be a lot of beautiful girls. Sign me up for that. So my so my you were you grew up in a camp. It was a camp, you said, a refugee camp. And, uh, yeah, it's a camp, yeah. yeah. How did it's, that it's look like, like? How did that look like in Europe? It was like an old, uh, old... I've been in multiple refugee camps. Mostly these are buildings right out of the city, of out of the village. And the mine, one, one of us, when I said it was like a, a, um, a place where you keep old people. How do you say that? Mm -hmm. uh, old age home. Mm -hmm. Old age home, yeah. But, and they, they reformed it to, uh, to a camp, a refugee camp. And the, the other one was like an old place where soldiers used to stay. And, and mm -hmm. they, they reformed that to a refugee camp. 
Mm-hmm. So what you can imagine is like, yeah, it was a building with two, two, 250 people in it. And, um, and it's funny because I always describe like the refugee camp for me personally as like it was like a hell and paradise in the same, same spot. And because emotionally it was very heavy for me because I, I had a strong feeling of responsibility. So every time we got rejected or every time we had problems with the police in our case, I would be really stressed out about the idea that I uh, that that one day they will send me back to Iran because I was getting used to it. It's like a very big bad thing you could. It's like the worst thing I think. One of the worst thing you can do to a child is like you pick him up from this place and you just put him on another side of the world. It's uh, to, to, still to this day. Sometimes I just I just black out, like black out from from the whole thing, and I have to remind myself why I'm speaking like Dutch, where am I, what my name is. And I discovered that that was the trauma of being, uh, being taken away from your home so terribly and so abruptly. Um, where was I? So I was thinking about the refugee camp. Yeah, so then, then uh, they, had, they, they, they did this me, uh, they did an offer to me, the, the Foundation of Frolic Aid. And there was this small theater group in another city that they were doing theater like uh, twice a week and at that time I was doing another education uh, uh, I was following another education and I was wanting to be a hotel manager something like that I don't know why I did it but I was doing something I was just I just trying to study like you know not staying home and uh, at the end of year they asked they were very happy about me and they asked me if I wanted to join them like professionally uh, every day and they would give me some money and I stopped right away with my other uh, uh, the whole hotel management study I was doing, and I just went, I went for it. And three years later, I, I applied for the most difficult academy in the Netherlands, in Maastricht Acting Academy. And very famous and got, one, yeah. Yeah, and I got, I got. Uh, they let me in. I said, I, uh, I got. Uh, what role did you did you what did you uh, audition for? Audition for, or what did you tell them when you when they asked you? Do a monologue or whatever. What did you do? Yeah, I had to do like some Romeo and Julia, uh, one scene. But you gotta understand, my Dutch was shitty. I I just came from the refugee camp, and I and that was one of the first thing I, I came there and I read the scene. I just didn't understand the words. I just like I could feel some part of it. I understand the situation, but I was I panicked. I was like I I it's, I cannot read this. I, I I won't be able to memorize the words. I don't understand the meaning of, and. But the guy was very nice. He said, listen, man, you're not here for the language, man. I just want to see if you understand acting. Just so if you lose the words, just use your own fucking words. Go for it. And, uh, and of course, we had some improvisations, tests. And, but I think like they saw me that I could act because I, I understand the situation. I had, when I was 17, I had life experience for uh, someone who's 30. So mm-hmm. that was in me. I didn't know shame. Mm-hmm. I was just big mouth kid who always, and I really liked attention because, I, I didn't have the right attention for my father. You know, I was a kid that I felt that I, I wasn't being seen by, by my dad and by the society. So all those things came together and it was actually make perfect sense for me to go to that school. And they, they accepted me. And that was, that was a moment I cried and I realized I really wanted. Mm-hmm. This is a, that's a incredible story. And um, did you feel... Or oh, now, do you, do you feel that society was open? Um, as you know, in America, we have this uh, social unrest for very, very good reasons now. And so often we read here, you know, about also, you know, the policies, or but also um, outbreaks against foreigners or refugees, immigrants um, in anywhere in Europe. So how was your experience? How, did, how do you feel as an immigrant artist? Do you feel... Um, I feel like that? shit. I feel like I was treated like shit. And, and it's, it's, it's fair for par- partly because as people, you know, you will always remember the negative, the negative impact you will hold, hold to it longer. Of course, there were a lot of nice people who, who you know, at, at the same football soccer club, I got rejected and they would call me names like you goddamn refugee. At the same place, you had this guy who said, I don't give a fuck about where you're from. If you want to play soccer, that's the play I love. You're going to play here. So, you know, I, I got rejected and uh, get hold by the same people that time. 
But to be honest, it it's it really scarred me on a way, and it, uh, the thing I was talking about, inferiority complex, it really mm-hmm. scarred me. Because uh, I remember not wanting to be that refugee. I remember like hating the fact that I had to get out of the bus and I would have to go to the left and then everybody would know that I'm a refugee. So I would fake it. I would walk to right till the bus was gone and then I would go back to the refugee. And these things I'm telling you, I, this all I discovered when I was older. As a kid, I was this angry boy who just, who just didn't know what to do with his emotions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 to be honest, you know, it's funny because, you know, the Dutch, the Dutch, the Netherlands made so much uh, uh, possible for me, you know. Yeah. Uh, but still, it's like the uncle who uh, who used to, like, do bad stuff to me when I was a child, you know, or like uh, the father who slept you, like, have physically, like, abused you, but he pays for your study, you know, he pays, you know, that, that's the, mm-hmm. that's the, that's the, um, it's the relation I have when I'm thinking about my relationship with the Netherlands. And, and of course, then you get older, then you start to see the real racism. Because you have two kinds of racism, right? There's one racism that said, hey, you black-faced fox, uh, go to your, back to your own country. We all agree that's wrong, right? We all agree about that. But you have this little sneaky racism. That, and you have this racism that people... They don't know they're acting racist, you know, it's because they, they sometimes they actually meant it very good. And that's like the tragic part because uh, you have a lot of white left progressive people who they're, they're not woken up about their own actions, you know. And, uh, and you see it also in the government. Now, we still have fucking Black Pete here, man. It's 220 in the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah. Like, Black Pete, say a bit about like, it. P- people might not know what it is. Yeah, B- Black Pete is this Dutch tradition, uh, and it's blackface, and it's all about and it and, and it, the history of it is all about the dehumanization of the African people because that the because that they could get away with all the f- terrible stuff they did in Africa. That's the whole psychological idea behind it. But we still do it, and that's it's some kind of up. a carnival tradition, right? The figure shows yeah, yeah, yeah. up, Sorry. and the white yeah, yeah. actor, like, white person pokes yeah. on blackface, and it's kind of made fun of a caricature. Uh, a racist description yeah. of a stereotype um, that uh, uh, kind yeah. of defines the other as not part of you. No, no. I read it. I read they are yeah, they are trying to uh, take it away. Uh, just is that true, or did you read anything? Yeah, ma, but like we are trying to do this like since our own school, man. It's like ten years already. But the, the thing is, you know, every year. Around December, we have the discussion, this ugliness on social media, and we're getting used to it. But I've learned that every time you're fighting, you're just not you're fighting about something that's that's deeper, that's 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 beneath all of that. And the truth is, you have like a lot of mostly white people in the Netherlands who are fed up that like we still getting more our voices, you know? Their attitude is, shut the fuck up, you're not from here, hold your head down, don't talk too loud, and, and they expect that this would be the whole thing. And it has been for generations, but you have my generation who say, no, you shut the fuck up, this is my country, and I'm not going back to my country, you go back to your own country. And that's the clash that we have been seeing. Mm. And, yeah. um, and, and it's very interesting time, but it's also very scary because um, emotions uh, can let to, can also bring us to very bad places. And now this December is coming and yesterday, you know, the thing is what I, what I really admire about the United States is the way black people and people with immigration background have fought themselves to a place that when you would say some stupid, when you, if 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 you would as a white man compare a black person to a monkey in the, in the United States, you would get fired. They accomplished that. There, that happened like last last year. It was this Hill Bale, this radio guy, uh, who compared one one beautiful black woman, Savannah Simmons, politician. He compares her with a monkey. So oh, take it easy, Savannah. And he got away with it, man. He's still making his programs. And, and we have, like, yesterday, there was this guy 
uh, Johan Derksen, I really, really hate that guy. Uh, and 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 they've been making jokes in this pro in this, in this TV show with men's. They've been uh, hu humiliating transgender people, um, people with immigration backgrounds, black people, and uh, they get they keep getting away with it. And they just yesterday they compared uh, a serious activist and rapper Akwazi to Swat Pete to Black Pete. There was a picture of him, and there was a picture of this guy who said Black Pete lives matter. And they show that, and the guy, the white guy on TV said, oh, that's a hero to me. That's what he said. That's a hero to me, that guy. And then he compared him to the, to the black rapper. And that was, I was furious, man. And the beautiful thing because of this whole Black Lives Matter thing is that people are speaking up more. So I was speaking up, and I see the post on Instagram, and then and the whole defund racism hashtag came up. And they actually, they, they get to manage like, Two big companies, they are not advertising anymore. They're going to talk to that guy. So that's a very beautiful, powerful thing. Yeah. Yeah. So t t why do you do theater? I mean, you came from there. And I guess you could have worked in the hotel. Why, why, why do you do theater? And in that time now where we and where we really questioning our fundamentals, why, as you said, who I, who am I? Where do I come from? What am I doing here? So wh why do you do theater? It is, it's about being able to actually have an impact that makes a difference. That's a very powerful thing. There, there, are, not, there are not a lot of things as powerful as that. That's one of them. But it's also about being seen. Because I told you, I've, I've felt like shit for a big part of my life. Like I was nothing. Like I was this, this, um, this little thing who was born to fail, you know. While I was a very smart, beautiful, smart kid. And, and it's also because of a part of the, the way the system is treating us. And, and with theater, you actually have the ability to talk for one and a half hour without getting interrupted. And those are very interesting dialogues to me because then I have the time to think about what I want to tell and, and, and trying to make, you know, trying to tell stories that are important, you know, like, like, the, like the, this play I'm uh, doing, Seat at the Table, where we was talking about. Yeah, we, you mentioned it. Tell us about what is what is the idea? A seat at the table means, yeah, symbolically in an imaginary way and in a real way, everybody sits at the table or um, in a society. No, 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 no. It's about having a fair place at the table upstairs, and in, and, and the whole the whole idea about it is that you wrote it's it, never right? Gonna you wrote it I and you act it, in it? I wrote it with more people, yeah. I wrote it with like uh, Nima Mohake, so this is my partner in crime, and with the actors. Uh, uh, we wrote it together, but it was uh, like some kind of a writer's room work where it was. So everybody was uh, working under the per per premise we had. And it was that racism led to inferior, if I'm not, uh, inferiority, inferiority comp thank mm -hmm. you, complex. Mm -hmm. And that that leads to that someone who is born here is never going to be able to find its roots here. And, uh, and, and the story was about the actors would tell that through their own experiences and the experience of uh, Kwame. That was the fiction line we wrote. And it was about this black, successful young lawyer who punched a white, white man randomly one day. Uh, and he was in therapy, and in through the five scenes, and that was the whole. That was the that was the that was the important line. Through the four or five scenes, you would get closer to the essence of his trauma, and that was that he was discriminated. Uh, he had to go through racism so badly; the trauma was so big that uh, that he, he he punched a man on the day he heard he was going to have a child, and the fear of bringing a black child on this world that he would have to go through the same experiences that 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 was his reason that was his pain and that we would have this beautiful monologue on the end of it about about this he's being scared to do the same and what kind of terrible father would do that it was very beautiful very very real because it was it was our struggle and our pain and and of course we we mixed it with a lot about a lot of humor you know the this the, the scenes of the actors and I, I write songs also i had 
some songs to get to the feeling. And the other scene, our own experiences was really about the absurdity of some fucking racist experiences we have been together. So the combination of that, the, the lawyer line and the actors would say as like people like this is what we go through. And that had also very, a lot of humor in it. And that combination, it made that, that the play worked very well. You know, we got nominated for it. Yes, it's very it, successful. It, and, uh, yeah, it was very important. Still, like, people people listen to it. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, the thing is, it's also our job as people with immigrant background uh, to, to uh, you know, to like educate. Because I can imagine, like, you know, I'm racist too, man. I have some, I have some racist stuff done, you know, I'm purposely, you know, this whole system uh, is a part of it. And, um, and that was, that was very important. And, and it had a lot of moving reactions of people. It, uh, that's the reason I'm making it. Feel. And the, you created a company with fellow actors or immigrants or how was it by, by a theater? How did you? Yeah, I have, I have this, uh, pardon me. I have this, uh, uh, my colleague I'm working with. And uh, we, we, we did a, we did a short movie together. It's got the Sacred Defense. It's a, it's a, originally, he's a movie director. And we worked on the short and got nominated for the student Oscars. And then I was like, me and you, we're going we're gonna to do stuff together. And he was always like this visionary guy. I was like this guy who gets things done. I just like to do. And he came with an idea from, I think we need to set our own shop. And then we started our own uh, foundation called Black Sheep Can't Fly. And my friends also from Iran. And, uh, and, and we do this with three and other, other uh, partners, Christina, and she's born in Lebanon. So we are like all people with immigration background. And we, uh, we mostly tell stories about now, you know, stuff about racism, refugees, uh, all those stuff. Incredible. And I know not only you got nominated it was a film for the student Oscar, also the your film that you were in became nominated as a foreign film for a nomination. And uh, so, yeah, you, yeah, you know, it's an incredible story that, you know, of the experiences out of that, you know, camps and then getting into that great acting yeah. school that Holland in a way offered you a place, but also torn its back. Meanwhile, America is so close. You know, we very few can come in from Syria. I think Germany took over over a million people. I think it was 4,000 at the time in, in, in the Syrians who were allowed to come to, to America. So, um, and you also uh, so successful and contribute to the, to the, to, uh, to the Dutch, Dutch culture. In that time of Corona, where you yeah, said you slowed down and you look at what you did and you think about what we're going to do, did something happen? Did something for you became more conscious? Is it a difference? Uh, are you a different person? Are you, um, did, did something, yeah. did the needle move? Yeah, very, 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 very. very. I, I could like advise it to everyone. Because every time you have like, because you know, they call it monsters and demons, right? But it's, it's really, they're just pictures. They're just, they're just images and pictures. You just, they, they, they just keep coming back. And I finally what understand. What pictures? What do you mean by it? A lot, man. Like, it was like, I would, I would have this, the traumatic moments of my life, you know, they would come back. But, you know, some people, my father, and I just, I just always would run away from it. And, and I think the, there comes a moment in your life that you will understand that all those emotions that you have put deep inside you, they're not dead. They're just buried alive. And eventually, they will come and get you. And I, I learned it on, I learned that in a hard way, I think, but. What hard way? What do you mean? I, I became this, I was very emotional. Like I'm, I, I have this image of being this strong, wise guy to myself, but, which I also am, but there's this child inside of me that's hurt and very bad. And it also need attention. And that time the child came up, you know, <laughs> the child was like, it, it, it wouldn't have it, you know? And, and, I, and of course I was, I was already in therapy and I discovered a lot, you know, I, I thought I had this inferiority complex it, that it was because of me being a refugee in the Netherlands, but which was true, but it's all, it, it was also because of uh, my relationship with my father, 
you know, and that, that, and that, brought, and I was always thinking about like, what the fuck, what's wrong with me? You know what, why can't I just get angry? Like I, I could go zero to 100 very quick. And I was, and I, why was I this mad kid? And I discovered that because I've been, I've, I've lived for my, through all my whole childhood and, and um, how do you say puberty, puberty? Is it good? Is it, is it yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. puberty? Yeah. Puberty, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sometimes I just lost the meaning of words. I I I I realized that um sorry, I, I lost what I was talking about. I don't know. What I was no, saying. no, that the demons you face what images, what did come up, you know, and you said in that time of yeah, corona, like some, you as some an artist. personal stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, there were some personal stuff, you know, and, and the discovery that I made, my new play, it's all is all of us is gonna be there, you know. So you wrote a about... play in that time of Corona. You wrote a no, monologue. In the time no. of Corona, I, I really discovered some very important information about myself, about the truth I was telling myself. And at the, it was there were there were a lot of lies I would tell myself to just get just to get by. And I faced those stuff. You know, a lot of it's personal, and it's it's not it's really not that interesting. It's all about uh, it's all about getting to like the bottom of your questions you know like why am i like this you know and i had when i had those answers i felt empowered i i forgive like uh, myself i forgive my father and i had i had these beautiful conversations with so many people you know and, and i get to understand what's important for me and, and who my true friends are and and after that when i recovered and that's now i'm doing a play and i'm gonna put all of this into it and I'm just gonna give back. You know, I realized I've been through a lot and everyone has been through a lot, but I don't, it doesn't mean that if you come from a hard place that your life has to be hard. That, that doesn't have to be true. And that you actually have a choice. You know, you, you, you can do, a lot of it is choice. You can choose for good. You can choose for facing your demons. And that's gonna be the play about it. And that's a very important, very powerful message for me. And I hope for everyone who sees the play. Hmm. Do you do you think the way you do theater, you know, you said you had worked with your friends and your 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 colleagues and you created the work and for film and also, you know, a place at the table um, as a company. So do you think something will also change the way you produce, create theater coming out of this time? Or do you feel it's continuing or reinforcing what you already discovered? Or is that something new? Like yeah, you mean the impact of the corona? You mean right? Yeah. Will it be? Will the? Yeah. Will there be something different in your approach? For sure. Of course, because what I'm telling you, you know, when you get to know yourself on that level, it's gonna change your whole vision about everything. And to me, this the play I'm doing. It it calls unpredictable past, because. I went looking back at myself, like looking at an angry kid, because I it's changed my view about who I was. You know, I thought I was mm -hmm. like this angry kid, but my anger it was right. You know, I thought I was, I was, I wasn't. Um, I thought I, I thought I was being a bad boy, but you know, I, I did everything in my power, but it was never enough. Mm. And but so I, when yeah. I, but yeah, I mean, yeah. is it like you say, I'm going to use Zoom. I'm going to perform it outside in theaters. I'm going to do it in the. I'm going to go to the oh, refugee you home. Like will you be? Will there be changes in form or the way you co-create or how you co-write it? Is there something where you feel something came clear to me, or do you feel mm -hmm. no? Actually, what we found was something that yeah, but it, you know, right. no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I. It's, fun. it's very funny because we as artists, especially here in the Netherlands, there's this image of that we are like, um, we, it's like also we are like this extra wheel on the, on the car, you know? That's the image of the politicians because we have now a right cabinet and that's, that's their image. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you know, in the quarantine time, the biggest proof is like, who, who could get like through those harsh times being inside without art? really like without watching a movie without listening to a song or i don't know like uh, whatever so that was a very big and and it got me the power to uh, being able to put, uh, to protect it and fight for that spot because i know like what we do is very necessary because I, I i think like the answer to that to your question would be i'm not gonna do theater outside or the, not all those stuff but i just realized 
for me personally that I, I, I've been through these things and I have to dedicate my life to just entertain people, to just bring them new ideas. That's, that's, that's going to be my, my, that's my narrative, you know, it's my whole thing. But yeah, sorry. I hope it's. A, I hope that's. No, an no, no. That's uh, that's that that makes makes a, a lot of sense. Uh, so the play you created, a place at the table. Um, did you was it a collective work then? As you said, did you the rehearsal process was um, um, was it with the theater and you had a space where to go or do you? How did you create yeah. it? Uh, this like uh, I created. I knew that I felt like anger about in racism. It was loud December. I think it was like five five years ago. I knew for sure I have to do. It's my duty to do something about racism because I've been through it so long. So that and I was surrounded by great people because I wasn't a, the, as good as I am right now. So I got very good help by Nima Mohaker. I had this old director. I had the people who were like really helping us and watching us. But the my into I had this intuition and it was I have to do something about this and I had my friends there were two black actors in Maastricht I knew and I knew I would uh, I want those guys and I was this white guy from Belgium and he had this real compassion when he talked about racism uh, and I, I picked him on base of those conversations I had with him and first of all we were gonna going to use this uh, a book called the black man with a white heart it's a very beautiful book about these two princes first princes from ghana that were brought in the netherlands in 1837 i think to just to, you know just to get the knowledge and then one day go back to africa so that they could help their own people and these people actually existed so i wanted to use that part for for the seat at the table but it just didn't work and then we came with a whole lawyer line uh but we did a lot of uh I had this big interview and we were like eight of us. You had the actors and then you had this guy, uh, Jeroen de Man, who was like, was this, it was a white young director and he was just going to help us. And that was very, very interesting because the first clash we had was on that table. And that was the, the, the Werner, my friend, he was, the, 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 he's from Suriname, he's a black guy. And he, he told about, I'm so tired of this shit and I'm never going to be going on the way on the street. No, I'm going to bump your shoulder. And he was very angry. And then you see like you ruined the white, the white guy. And he was like, yeah, but I don't get it. Why is he so angry? And then I understood like, all right, all right. There's a lot of anger, but my only job is just how to like make the audience understand where this pain is coming from. That was the, my own. And, 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 I, and I wanted to do it uh, with balls, you know, I didn't want to go white walk on my toes. I want to just be, and it's funny because the one of the lines uh, in the first scene is, I hit him because he was white. You want to hear that? And then he would this monologue about like that, how being discriminated to him, it led to be a racist also, you know, and with a lot of conversation. And then we came up with a line that we, the, the moment, the important moment was that when we knew it's going to be about this fear to bring a black child on the world. Then things started to roll. And then the whole thing started to roll. Mm. And of course, you know, I had like this, uh, you know, sometimes you have to do research for, for work. And my life was research and the life of all the actors and, and the writers who are joining us. So uh, it was, I think like one of the reasons it was successful, it was really honest. Everyone who made that was like fed up with this whole racism thing. And that was the big power. That's the, that's, that was the reason that as a small group, we were able to sell out like the Amsterdam uh, theater, like where 700 people come without a lot of promotions. Not, but it was like the story was so important for the time we, le we lived in. And that worked very good. Hmm. Yeah, we, we didn't really hear about it in the US. We should have. We just have such a tunnel vision. We don't really... No, so much. It's a big island, but still, it's an island, and uh, this yeah. is an important contribution you made from your story and your artistic engagement, and also it's, to channel those. It is, uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Go, 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 go ahead. Go, no, no, go, no. Go, go. No, go ahead. Oh, it's 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 really one. It's it's really one of my dreams, like to especially that play, like sit at the table, that we would like play this for for companies, and we are trying it for companies in the Netherlands. You know, like even working with the government, because like 
a lot of people working in every government institution, everyone says we need more diversity. Well, when you look up at the places like where they make the decisions, all whites. So that's a real problem. And I hope like we could use this. I, th I, I honestly believe that we could like uh, hold our hands together like with governments and artists and work at some really important social issues that we have. And it's one of my dreams also. I don't know if the play would work in London or New York or a place like that. I, I would like do it for free just to try it out. You know, if it would Let's work. see. We'll try to find community. something. We'll try to find something for you and to see how people would react and see that it. That would be and great. Yeah. It, yeah, that would be great. Why not? You know, the time yeah. of Corona I would love change. to do it like with, with actors from there to tell their stories, just have this the, the line of the lawyer and then just make mm -hmm. the play. Again, that was, that was like a dream. Of so mine. it's kind of a testimonial documentary theater in a way where you then switch it, you know, with some narrative of that, um, of the lawyer's story, which you connected to it. And it should be a universal um, 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 story. So the idea it would is, be to go, is. yeah, in the Netherlands to say, let me go to government institutions, inside factories, yeah, I'm, I'm, inside I'm companies. That, and that's yeah. a, that's so, a, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, like it. judges, teachers, uh, people are working at the government, decision makers, you know. The, the, the thing is, we have this, there was this thing on a paper that the, a judge uh, thought that the lawyer was a criminal because he was black. Because <laughs> he, and he told, the judge told him like, can you stand over there, this is your place. And he was like, I'm like defending a guy. And yeah. like, yeah. I, like, I think like the image that black people can be successful it's still not really there in subconscious of a lot of white people. And that's going to yeah. take some time. But like, I believe that we as an artist, we could, we could like paint the picture that where we could go as a society, or we could paint the picture of someone's pain, like layer by layer. And, and that's, we could, and then we could make great impact. Hmm. When it comes to theater, um, who are your heroes? What, what inspired you? Um, well, who did you look up to as a, as a mentors, role models, or artistic work, writers, companies, uh, in festival? Who do you think is, uh, was important for you coming? Yeah, it's funny because 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 I'm a refugee kid, and I was I had never never I didn't have any dream to to be a theater maker. I I I only, I only wanted to be seen, you know. That's why I went doing acting, and then I realized. Like, if I want to act in good stuff, I have to write it myself because I'm in a white country. Never, no, I'm, I will never get the opportunity. And sorry, I lost the question. What was the question? What, is, what did, is there a theater that inspired you? Are there masters oh, yeah, or right. companies? Is, is there something where you say, hey, I want to be like this or that, her, him, this play? Or did you have yeah. a role model or yeah, did you no. make it up yourself? I, I didn't have, I, 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 my role models were like, I watched a lot of movies. So I, I, I really like the movies were about something when I would learn something. I learned a lot from movies. So I, I knew I could do the same, but I didn't have like, I wasn't, I always was struggling with the, you know, I love Shakespeare, but I didn't understand like, why the fuck would I do this play right, right now? The world is burning. So why would I do like a play from 1640 in, in, in Russia with, with three women who are just bored, you know? It didn't make sense to me. So I, I, I directly, I was like, no, I'm not gonna do the old theater stuff they were living with. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try something new. And of course, in that way, we had this, this director called uh, Eric the Fruit. I heard his name a lot, because uh, he was like one of the first guys in the Netherlands who would actually write a play about our part in Afghanistan. He would just go to Afghanistan, do six months of research, and he would write a play. And he started it, and then, and, and I am part of a generation theater makers that we are telling our own stories. And that works very good. There's really a big hunger from it, also from the audience. And we had a couple of success. Uh, but to be like having an example, like a theater maker, I didn't have one. I had just these, a lot of big, great movies in my head. What are the movies? What did you look at? Um... Like, you know, funny, I discovered I love movies and I went to the IMDb and top 250, I, I watched all of these movies. And I start from, from above, like, of course, The Godfather, Shawshank Redemption. Uh, and, I, and I came there and I see all of these movies. Uh, but for me, I think the most important part was my inspiration was that, that there was a place I could talk and I would be heard. 
that was the whole thing that that was really attractive to me. Uh, that that part, like what the, you the said, part of I, could, yeah, the part of I could like have impact that people would listen to me. That part. Yeah, what what you said earlier. It's an hour and a half, and people have to listen there in the chair. Yeah, you yeah, know, and that that, that was what theater funny. can do, and uh, yeah, it is. It's always been a vehicle for me, you know, theater. It's, it's always been like. Uh, 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 with theater, I can go to that place, you know, and make sure that I can tell those stories. Do you, uh, the, what, the, mm -hmm. in the time, ahead, now, the time now, did you read uh, or did you listen to music? You said, I, I realized as so many why art mm -hmm. is important because it's Corona time. Where would we be without that? So what did you listen mm -hmm. to or what did you read? Or what did you, how did you engage? What was inspiring to you? I, I cooked a lot. I cooked, I created a lot of food. I started to cook it and I, and I was listening to a, like a lot of podcasts and that was what I was doing because, because I'm a musician also, when I'm making music, I don't really listen to a lot of music and through quarantine, I, I just started, I think maybe somehow, some way I wanted to get away from art also and I mm -hmm. just focus on the art of cooking, just, just making stuff like understanding how that works. So. No, I, I didn't watch like something special. Like I saw this Lebanese movie, uh, Kafernion. I don't know if I yeah. pronounce it. The, the little boy, oh yes. The little yeah, boy man. who uh, oh, yeah. that, that really, has to survive that on his own. Yeah. Yeah, that, that really, yeah, of course, the boy has to survive on his own. There you go. That's why it really touched me. <laughs> Incredible story, yeah. yeah. Beautiful, yeah. very beautiful. Yeah. Those stuff, I think. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. We're coming a bit uh, closer to um, to the end of our talk. Um, let's say if yeah, it flies talk, by. Yeah. yeah, if you had to talk to uh, to someone, the young someone just getting into acting school, and Corona would happen, like or to artists or theater makers in America, in Chicago, or in Seattle, or people who listen to us from India and uh, South Africa, Indonesia, Hong Kong, which is in such a complicated moment also now. You know what? What? What yeah. do you say? How do you use the time of Corona where we are in now, if even with the restriction? What, what theater should we be doing? What, what is of significant? What should we be focusing on? I think, like, to me, I would focus, focus to sh stories where there's a, where is a, where is a kind of like an urgency behind it. Uh, uh, like a society, let's talk about society and, and humanly. Uh, that's very important that you feel that that story is, a, that that story is, has to be a story of now and how person, and it ha doesn't have to be private, but it's, there has to be something personal in it for you that you, you wouldn't be able to, to sleep if you wouldn't do this story, if you wouldn't tell this story. That's very important to me. Like when you also look at like movie directors who were very good in the beginning of their careers and now they're just like, they're just telling stories, you know, just getting scripts. So that makes a very big difference. And uh, if you want to make theater, I think it's like find, find what's your fascination and make sure that you go through like a personal experience, but you always tell something that's universally so that, you know, you don't get any private. That's what I was saying. And, and I think like, if you like, you look like me. If you like, from you have a migration background, is I think like the moment you realize the impact you actually have for just being someone with the color and just staying on a stage and doing like a play of a of a guy who's empowered, that thing will roll in thirty years. Some child has seen that and it's gonna affect him, you know, because. When I grew up, all my all my uh, people I would look up to in the media, they were all black because there weren't a lot of people with who looked like me, you know. So I love like Chris Tucker. I like all these black dancers. Watch, I like all these black actors. Those 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 guys were my examples, you know. And I think like tell your own story, you will push someone else to tell his, and so we all would engage more. Hmm. Yeah, that's very. Very, very good advice and to tell your own story. Um, as you said earlier, do uh, a play that's needed now, you know, and uh, not uh, something that perhaps was right 
centuries ago and don't do yeah. karaoke where you're just re-sing something, but it's not an original and most probably not even as good as the original. But there are sometimes, no. they are better and it happens, but what is um, of important than to be, to, to, to be visible? And I like the idea to say, you know, people will have to listen to you. And if you also tell a serious story, a painful story, but also, as you said, with a humor, which might be, you know, which Very a lot. we hear a lot, whether it's Indonesia or India, it's, it's uh, from uh, um, South Africa, where we heard from the, the Basil Jones, the years of the apartheid, you know, he was able to get away with things, you know, from censorship with his puppets that you normally couldn't. So, um, yeah. and they said how significant the contribution of the arts was to change. You are part of that worldwide community of artists who, through painful yeah. personal experience but you channeled it your anger and you said i'll find a way to do it and to tell it so people understand for a moment uh, where where it comes from so this is a very very strong and a powerful story let's see we should find a way to get you here once things open and um, <laughs> it's a great story and it was you know people listen it in the netherlands and so it should be enough reasons for us to also um to be interested and open to so really um thank you for sharing um yeah, um, in that time and maybe look up what the Siegel Center is and maybe other talks on how round uh, we, we did we yeah. have uh, coming to an end of the week you know and uh, yeah. uh, we are um, just finished the lineup for next week we have Muriel Miguel and Gloria Miguel from the great uh, Spider Women's Theater the Native American indigenous theater company that for decades in New York tries to do work oh, it's still crazy. Have, good. don't have their own theater they should there should be a, a place for them. And uh, maybe the time of Corona and the revelation will help to, to get theaters like them and, uh, who, and what they represent uh, more listened to. We have uh, Daniele Francisca from the Caribbean, from Martinique. He will tell us what's happening in, uh, in the Caribbean and in Martinique, what it means to be an artist there in the time of Corona. The great, great Eugenio Barba from the Odin Theater, a, a national treasure, a living legend in his work since the 60s and 70s and 80s, who has defined also what we think about theater and is a point of reference, like in a, you're on a ship and you look at the stars where you navigate, wherever you go, away from it or to it, but he is one of those, those uh, great lights and, um, and Paul Price, an uh, American actor and filmmaker and director, uh, will talk about his experience as an uh, actor uh, going through Corona and what theater making makes for him and how the system Feels him. I liked also what you said. You know, it's a white country there. I will never get roles, so of course I have to do my own. Yeah, it's sure. so very different, you know, to to yeah. everybody else. But for you to say, no, of course, it's a. How would I get a role? And we heard that from Woody King, who runs the Federal City. Said when I was a young black actor, the six. No, I wouldn't get a role. I wouldn't also get in. I was black. It was impossible. And uh, yeah. and like as we said, you say to a fish, uh, say you in water. The fish will say, what's water? You know, and say, yeah. no, you're in water, and David yeah. said that so famously. Beautiful. And um, and then we have a Liva Yassi, a great uh, playwright, poet, also, and a documentary filmmaker from Syria. She lives in Berlin, and mm. she will tell about her uh, her experience um, of trying also to bridge uh, identities as uh, Saman uh, does. So Saman, again, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you guys so much. How round yeah. for ha ha having us another week, uh, TJ, uh, VJ, and uh, Thea, and uh, and to our Siegel team, Andy and uh, San Yang, and to you, the listeners, really for taking time out. There is a lot of yeah, out thank you. Very busy, busy in these days. Strangely enough, and also so many keep on working, also from home. So it means a lot to us that we have audiences, such a diverse audience, such audience from all the states in the U.S. and so many international countries. And that is something we need to listen to, voices of artists. They have been on the right side of history, on the right side, on that complex struggle for freedom and liberties. And, um, and uh, we are making a great contribution. And uh, again, the day-to-day -day commemorating that change is possible, is thinkable, is happening. Juneteenth is an important day and, uh, and also a reminder of why, why we do art and why it is significant. I like what you said, everybody who is at home now can go out. Yes, everybody reads, listens to music, looks at, it, looks at films or theater recording which so strongly connected. So it is a, a, a clearer than ever. And even so, we also being told we are non-essential and we can't go out. 
So thank you so much, uh, Saman, and yeah. uh, all of you guys listening, um, stay safe. Wear the mask, uh, take your distancing. We do not know how, what will happen with this virus. Only 1% has immunity in the moment. 70% would be needed for herd immunity. So um, it is still out there. And I think a virus doesn't care if a Trump or others say, no, it's okay, you open up. It's no longer dangerous. It's not true. We still have to behave, but if we are careful, uh, nothing bad will happen and we follow those simple rules. So thank you very much and bye-bye in Saman. Uh, have a great hey, dinner in, uh, in the Netherlands. Yeah, and really, thank you, thank you and to Alessandra for connecting.